I would like to welcome everybody here to, uh, uh, to hear today's uh, presentation. Now, the reason we're starting late uh, is that, as usual, with any presentation at Dartmouth College, uh, we're waiting for people, we were waiting for people to run from all different obscure parts of the campus to be here. And uh, I, I now believe that we have an audience, which as I told our distinguished speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Gajeshian, uh, it's the high quality of the audience that counts. An incredible diversity of students, people pursuing honorary uh, uh, senior theses, distinguished faculty who've come all the way from Morocco in one case and all the way from Brooklyn in other cases uh, uh, in, order, in order to be here. Uh, more seriously, uh, uh, Dr. Kasheshian is somebody whose work I've had the pleasure of following since the mid-1990s. He got a PhD in 1985, and unlike a number of other academics, uh, he, you know, he, he did his thing in the formal academic setting, uh, but then he decided, since he was very interested in the Arabian Peninsula, that he'd spend a lot of time in what I would call uh, uh, permanent field research. For those of you who follow the Arabian Peninsula, it's a very hard place to follow from, um, uh, from afar. Um, I've worked in the Arabian Peninsula in North Africa. In North Africa, I can get people to talk about many, not all sensitive things, via Skype in the modern media these days. From the Arabian Peninsula, um, you can set dates to meet people if you're lucky, uh, but nobody is going to write long letters or uh, let their heart out or talk about issues of succession or other things like that. Uh, Joe Kasheshian, uh, has uh, at various times been, uh, been associated with the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, with their Middle East Center there, with the Rand Corporation and elsewhere, and he is a compulsive and distinguished writer um, because he spends so much time in places like Kuwait, or right now, uh, uh, for uh, two years, I believe, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, the Sultanate of Oman, and other places. He's one of the reliable people where uh, only in what I said do you know that he's bridging the world of academics, the world of policy, and the ability to communicate in several languages to a wider audience. So uh, that's the best thing. I could recite a number of books, but uh, you, some of you have computers open and uh, these days, you can just go type in the name Kasheshian, spell it correctly, and uh, you can dispense with anything uh, that, uh, that I would have to say. His talk today is based on a book which I've left far away in my briefcase, uh, but it's Efat Athanayan, who is the, I've read your book, Joe, the third wife of King Faisal. And if I'm wrong, you can correct me. Uh, but uh, the third wife of King Faisal, uh, who was uh, uh, for a number of years in Istanbul, uh, and a number of those years you could not say you were from Saudi Arabia because that was uh, in a formal sense to come in the near future. At the age of 16, uh, she came back to Saudi Arabia, and the two things that you have to remember about by then Queen Afet uh, was what she did to further higher education uh, in Saudi Arabia for women, uh, and surprise of surprise, what she was able to do for her extended family. Um, there are a number of people who are prepared to say that women, you know, have been, uh, uh, don't have much of a, quote, public role, and the only thing I can say is well, maybe you ought to spend a little bit more time thinking about what private and public mean outside of North America and Europe, because uh, you would find that the queen could do many other things. In his book, which just came out, 
some of the surprises that you see are things like the king, King Faisal, that is, who died in 1975. Uh, she died in 2000. And the queen having, your phrase is Western style dinners, which means men and women sitting down together and talking. That's not supposed to happen in Saudi Arabia. But, uh, you know, if you're a king or a queen, you can make lots of things happen and you can do other things. So, uh, so uh, what Joe's going to do is, is, is talk about this extraordinary woman. And of course, that's a way of bridging into the question of asking uh, uh, more interesting things, not only about gender in Saudi Arabia, uh, but ways about politics that can uh, relate to how to understand what's important and not, what's not important, so you can get beyond reading things like USA Today uh, uh, or, uh, I hold my breath, the New York Post, uh, which I go to when I want the half-digested journalism before, before it gets cleaned out in other ways. So, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Joe Kisheshian. Thank you very much. As Dale said, it's the, it's the quality that counts, not the quantity. I'm ha truly happy to be, to see so many of you and appreciate your presence. Uh, it's not every day that one sees folks assemble to hear about an Arabian queen, one who hailed from a country that is often in the news for allegedly creating tensions and adding fuel to various fires. What will follow is a somewhat scholarly talk about a leading personality who passed away in 2000, but whose legacy is alive and well. Allow me before I start to take just a few moments to tell you why I wrote this book and how difficult the process was. As you know by now, this is my 11th book on the Gulf region and the fifth on Saudi Arabia. And like all of its predecessors, took the better part of nearly three years to research, compose, and publish. When you spend several years on a subject, you cannot but develop understanding unless you set out to smash it. Yet setting out to write about a woman who lived in a segregated society was even more challenging than I assumed. That, truth be told, I did not embark on a crusade to either load or denigrate Ifbat al tunayyan I was simply curious to discover the person who left her mark on King Faisal a subject that fascinated me ever since I was a little boy who saw the king at the open air terminal building in Beirut, Lebanon, and about whom I composed the political biography in 2008. In other words, I discovered Affat through Faisal and knew that she must have been a remarkable individual. I simply was curious to find out more about her. Yet as a man, I did not realize when I set out on the project how challenging it would be Although the queen's female offspring were worthy legatees who welcomed my systematic, even intrusive questions, others were not as forthcoming. And since I needed to interview many women uh, that worked at the institutions Queen Affet created, in other words, complete strangers to me, uh, there were a few hurdles to cross. Those of you who know how difficult it is to navigate in that kind of an environment will appreciate the efforts that went into it. Those who do not know will hopefully discover some of its more charming consequences in the book. Suffice it to say that a small team was necessary to identify potential interviewees, make arrangements to secure appointments, persuade them that a male American researchers would be asking personal questions even if several received me wearing a full niqab, cover face, travel to their destinations, exchange traditional greetings in what is still a highly conventional society when women do not mingle with strangers, especially males, to gather original materials about a person adored by most of the folks who knew her. My interviews with several elderly women who knew Ifat al Thunayan very well and who could tell me many stories about her, and they did, was something I will never forget and that I tried to share in this book. Of course, I was impressed, though my chief hurdle was to be careful and eschew a hagiography. Because I did not know the queen, 
and never met her. I could only see her photographs, read a few letters she composed, and heard her voice over a family se session mischievously recorded by one of her grandchildren. Over the course of multiple interviews with 53 individuals, itself a formidable challenge, it became clear that many were truly envious of the late Queen's abilities to function, even shine in Saudi society. And as the book will soon be published in Arabic, my hope is that many Saudi women and hopefully many Saudi men will discover their queen as well. That knowledge is a great recompense as the conservative society struggles with reforms that truth be told are likely to change it permanently the next generation. Now allow me to close this short aparté by sharing with you what I consider to be the three approaches to writing books in general and why I think this book is worth reading. There are books that praise the subject and those that deride it. Then there are those that add value by delving on rarely discussed subjects or those that are difficult to access. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, and unless one is studying angels with whom one cannot find fault, 99% of what is available is truly negative. Even original research is skewed, nowadays sparkled with anti-Wahhabi prose that pretends to offer expertise on takfiris and other extremists. I'm not going there. This, therefore, is my modest contribution to add a little value and tell the story of a woman who left her mark on Saudi society. Now, according to Robert Lacey, who wrote a very interesting book some years ago called The Kingdom, Prince Faisal bin Abdul Aziz made a stop in Istanbul after his 1932 visits to Warsaw and Moscow and brought back with him a new wife, a woman whose impact on Saudi Arabia was to prove, in its way, more revolutionary than anything that a Soviet friendship treaty was likely to have achieved." End quote. The colorful reportage notwithstanding, and while Ifat al-Thunayan was certainly an intelligent, articulate, and forceful young woman, the only al-Saud princess who became popularly known as queen, no other successors has, have been, has been given this designation. The viceroy of the Hejaz did not find his future wife in Turkey. Lacey further reported that Ifat and her mother, Asia, asked Faisal during this alleged Istanbul sojourn to help settle a land dispute between uh, Ahmed al-Tunayyan, Ifat's uncle, and family members. Truth be told, there was no such land dispute, and although Ahmed, uh, Ahmed al-Tunayyan, the uncle, had in fact gone to Saudi Arabia to be an advisor to uh, King Abdul Aziz, the founder of the kingdom. In fact, that period was only for about a year, a year and a half, uh, and there was, as far as I could tell, there was no land dispute, there was no land either in Saudi Arabia or elsewhere. The important thing, however, was that Ahmed al Thunayyan accompanied Faisal when Faisal, at the age of 11, 11 and a half, was sent by his father to Europe, and during this trip, probably conversations occurred between the two men. No one could verify this, obviously, that in fact there were family members involved uh, in, uh, uh, there were family members related to the Al Saud that were in Turkey and that they were thinking of coming back. Lacey in his book talks a great deal about allegations against uh, Faisal being a womanizer and that Ifat came and tamed her, him as well. But again, this is part of the mythology that writers sometimes give license, themselves license to. The late queen was a descendant of the branch of the Al Saud that was forcibly removed to the Ottoman Empire in the 1800s. Her grandfather, Abdullah bin Abdullah bin Thunayyan, this is very strange to have a person and the father's name similar, Abdullah bin Abdullah, but the reason why it occurred is because the boy uh, was born the night when the father passed away. So therefore, they named him after him. And, and because the Ottomans were looking for the father, Abdullah bin Abdullah, when Abdullah bin Abdullah essentially ended up in Mumbai as a businessman, the Ottomans caught him and shipped him with the entire family as a hostage uh, to Constantinople in those days, nowadays, nowadays, of course, Istanbul. 
And the family lived for many years, became part of the Majlis al-Ayan, Majlis of the Notables, were on the payroll of the Ottoman Empire for a while, and the Sultan uh, married several of the Arab dignitaries, including Abdullah bin Abdullah, who had five sons and a daughter, including the father of Ifat Muhammad Saud. Muhammad Saud, therefore the father, was born in Constantinople, and he served in the armed forces of the Ottoman Empire, eventually perished during World War I, when uh, he probably was sent to the Iraqi front, and there is absolutely no way to find out what happened. The records are essentially not available. In addition to Iffat, Muhammad Saud fathered a son, Zaki, who was the future queen's only full brother. When the doctor was killed in battle, uh, his widow married Ibrahim Adham, with whom she had uh, Mawara Muzaffar and Kamal, Ifat's half-brother and sister. Uh, Ifat was born, I should say a few words about Kamal Adham as well, who was the adored brother. I devote an entire section in the book to him. Uh, he played a very important role. He was Faisal's right-hand man for everything that's related to sensitive issues and for many years was responsible for foreign intelligence in the kingdom. Faisal trusted him. They grew up together in the same family household and obviously there was a great deal of trust between the two. Ifat was born in 1916 and lived the first few years of her life in Constantinople. Uh, and because of World War I situation, she essentially, on the advice of her aunt, Jawharan, decided to write a letter after the father passed away and there was no, no news from him, to write a letter to Abdul Aziz bin Abdul Rahman, the founder of the kingdom, saying, please take us in. We are a family. We would like to return. The founder sends a reply saying, you're most welcome. You can return whenever you want, ostensibly to perform Hajj. So therefore, the first time that Queen Ifat sets foot in Saudi Arabia is in 1932 at the age of 16, and she is with her aunt performing Hajj. Now, I'm going to save the interesting parts of the first encounter between the two of them for those of you who plan to read the book. Suffice it to say that Prince Faisal, who became the, king's, the kingdom's third ruler in the 20th century, first met his future wife after she arrived in Mecca to perform her pilgrimage with her paternal aunt, Jawharan. In the book, I talk about Jawharan. I'm not going to delve much time here. Jawharan was handicapped, and she moved on a wheelchair. And the experience that the queen had with her aunt, looking after her aunt, must have affected her in, in, in such a way that, in fact, the queen was responsible for the creation of several health institutions to look at after handicapped people in the kingdom. This is something which hardly, is hardly discussed in the kingdom or elsewhere. What happens to all the handicapped individuals in society? Who looks after them? Are they shunned away? Well, when Ifat was uh, the queen, and even before when she was uh, the princess of the Hejaz, obviously, uh, her, the aunt had a primary role in her majlises, always will be wheeled in and showed the kind of respect that everybody could witness and see. Therefore, changing the mentalities of people that if somebody is handicapped, doesn't mean that that person has to be shunned away. No, on the opposite, that that individual has a role to play in society and that must be taken into account as well. And I think that this is the reason why the institutions that exist today in the kingdom that look after handicapped members of society owe so much to her, even though most Saudis don't know that in fact she was responsible for creating these places. And of course, the, the queen, when she arrived in the kingdom, did not speak any Arabic. All she knew was some Turkish. And, and uh, later on, it was discovered that uh, uh, she had even a, a teaching certificate because she was destined for a life of a teacher to look after the family. Nobody knew of the fact that she had credentials as a teacher when she arrived. Uh, and she never spoke about this to anyone. Later on, after she passed away, the certificate was discovered in the paperwork uh, by, by her children. But of course, because she did not know any 
Arabic, and Faisal did not know much of Turkish, so therefore they taught each other their respective languages, and although eventually she learned Arabic, she spoke with an accent, and therefore the label al Turkiya, the Turkish one. And, and that label stayed with her throughout her life. Incidentally, she returned back once uh, in the mid-1960s to Turkey uh, with her family on an official visit uh, and, uh, and decided that she would never set foot in Turkey again because of what she saw and that they didn't like in those days, of course, the military dictatorship uh, in Turkey. But uh, the fact that she spoke Turkish meant that four of her children were fluent in the household as well. The princely couple had nine children together that survived, uh, uh, five sons and four daughters, about whom I talk a great deal in the book as well, because obviously this is a remarkable family that has made contributions. And to those, according to those who knew Effet al Thunayan, she was extremely well organized. She sewed with her mother's assistance the curtains of their new home in Mecca, home. You know, it was a mud house. Uh, when she arrived, she comes from a very sophisticated city, Istanbul, uh, in the 19, around the turn of the century, was a very sophisticated, advanced city compared to Mecca, which was a backwater in those days. Uh, obviously, she was shocked. There was, not even, there was not even proper health facilities, proper sanitation facilities inside the house, uh, and, and there was no curtains, none of the things that we take for granted. She was responsible for creating all of that. More important than anything else, she was an excellent listener, and she listened very carefully, and joined in conversations as appropriate, spoke with moderation, but always with a great deal of authority, and she was fully conscious of her role as the spouse of the Viceroy of the Hejaz. And interestingly enough, she was an avid reader, and Faisal brought her many books during his travels, and they subscribed to various magazines that were delivered, quote unquote, to the palace, for whatever that was. Throughout her life, but especially after she became queen, Ifat al-Tunayan played the leading role in Saudi female society, attended many state functions, including graduations, and received female state visitors. She was a guest at various official functions and traveled extensively on a private basis, especially in Europe. She often accompanied her husband on official visits. In fact, I've seen a picture of her at the Elysee Palace in Paris during a state dinner for um, a president that jo President Georges Pompidou delivered. And if you look at her picture, obviously, this is a modern woman with a nice hairdo uh, in nice clothes, jewelry, and so on and so forth. So she knew uh, her role rather well. Now, to say that she was tireless as well as determined will be an understatement, but uh, as Dale mentioned in his introduction, there were two primary areas of interest to Queen Effet, and she never wavered from either one of them throughout her life. One was education, the fact that she needed to create the kind of institutions that did not exist in the kingdom when she arrived there. Until that time, most of the education that occurred in the kingdom was the religious variety, most young people who were programmed to uh, uh, read and, and uh, re recollect and, and, uh, and repeat the Quran verbatim, essentially learn it verbatim, and that was about it. Here comes a, a, a woman, a young lady, who wants to change everything, and not only that, she wants to make sure that young women also uh, receive education. And towards that end, she creates several institutions. The institutions at the beginning fail, simply because there are not enough students, enough parents who are willing to send their daughters to this kind of an institution. It will be away, it will be more or less of, on a dorm basis. No respecting, no self-respecting family would allow uh, their daughter to be away from home and, and under the care of someone else, total stranger. That is shameful. Obviously, the experiment failed, and I, I discuss the details in the book, uh, but she persists, she tries again, hires the best Egyptian, Jordanian, and Lebanese teachers she can lay her hands on, restarts the school called Dar al-Hanan, 
Uh, and eventually, what she does, she acculturates the elite members of the Jeddah society, since the schools were first in Jeddah, so that by putting her own daughters into the grind, if you would like, the others will participate, and eventually Dar al Hanam becomes the premier high school in the kingdom. It still probably is one of the best institutions in the country. Eventually, as I discuss in the book as well, she would take this a step further by creating a women's college, Ifat College, which is now a university. And the way she goes about getting the licenses, because you need licenses for universities, is remarkable. I've included the original Arabic letters that she wrote to King Fahad at those days and Crown Prince in those days, Abdullah, and how she pleaded her case. And those of you who know Arabic who will take a look at these letters, the trans uh, some of the uh, best parts of the book are translated by me in the book and, and explained. But those of you who read Arabic would enjoy her own rationale, will enjoy how she approaches the senior members of the family. I was not going to talk about this, but since it came up, I just, remain, uh, I, I just remembered the, the idea. Of course, Faisal was assassinated in 1975. And, and she was devastated by this. She collapsed, literally. And for several years, she left uh, Saudi Arabia, went to her Paris apartment. She had an apartment there for many, many years, and stayed away from the kingdom because she was so de dejected. A few years later, when time heals, obviously, uh, she returned to the kingdom. And lo and behold, instead of her going to the palace, to meet with the king, with the heir apparent and everything, the king comes to visit her. The heir apparent come and visit her. This shows the kind of respect she commanded within the ruling family because throughout the years, her table was where everybody met. All the senior princes of the family, all the senior princesses of the family were regular guests and she was held in very high esteem by other members of the family, people who would listen to her, people who would pay attention to what she had to say. All her brother-in-laws really thought that she was a breath of fresh air. But I will add something even more than that. I don't know how she managed this. I haven't figured this out, even though I wrote a book about her. There are still some mysteries about this woman. Uh, I don't know how she managed it, she managed it, but she became a pillar of the Al-Saud. She was the one that actually protected the family. She was the one that brought everybody together. And she would be quite upset with a king, as happened with King Khaled, when Khaled uh, uh, removed one of the Al-Saud family members, senior members from the government. And Ifat, in a conversation, said, you made a mistake. Your brother Faisal would have never done something like this. You cannot work against family members. You have to make sure that we protect each other and that unless we stick together, we're gonna to pay the ultimate price for it. She was, in other words, quite aware of the importance of the family, quite aware of the role that she played as a unifier to bring all the family together. Now, let me turn next and the two main uh, areas, uh, main questions that you may have on, on your mind, namely the role of women in the kingdom uh, with all that entails in what is a largely segregated society. Now, in the book, I talk about the background of the role of, of women and veiling and all that. Of course, this is a very sensitive subject. One has to be very careful. The position of women in Islam, we all know that uh, Islam gave women the kind of rights that very few societies gave until until recently, but nevertheless, in a segregated society, you have the burden of having to come to terms with half of the population that is put aside, shunned, if you would like. Aifa changed all that. In, a, in her way, she changed all that. She changed it by doing two things. One, the education road that I hinted at, but equally important, she understood that what determined the fate of the country was gender equality. She understood she could not go against society's pillars, 
against the religious establishment that controlled gender uh, and, and education and all the other aspects of society. But she wanted to change all of that gradually, and she did. Let me give you an example. In one of the instances, for example, when she wanted to introduce certain changes uh, in the education curricula, uh, the senior clerics were very much opposed to it. But she didn't, she didn't run to her husband and say, why don't you issue a decree and let's get it over with. And that way everybody can, can uh, accept it. Rather, what she did, she called in these clerics. She actually picked up the phone herself talked to the clerics, invited them to come to the palace, and had a conversation with them about what measures they had to take in order to facilitate the changes that she wanted to introduce. Now, it took some doing to actually have the courage and the wherewithal to go about summoning to the palace senior clerics. Now, this is unheard of, and nobody talks about these issues, but it happened. That's the beauty of these things. These things happened, and not just once, not just twice, but repeatedly. This was her way of getting things done without necessarily relying on her position in the government and the fact that she was the queen of the country and that the king would not refuse anything she wanted to do. She herself never wore the veil. Her face was always exposed. When she stepped out, she put a shawl over her head, but immediately when she was in private, she removed it. And she was technically opposed to it, but in an environment that she was living in, in the country that she was living in, accepted that norms will need to be respected, and she would, did not want to go uh, against that. Now, as I say, there is a lot more that I could talk about, but what I want to concentrate for the rest of my talk, for the next 10, 10 minutes or so, to talk about Ifat's role in Saudi women. It seems to me that Queen Ifat attempted to create a solid modernizing environment for Saudi women so that they could articulate ideas to society and value to their communities and enjoy the fruits of life as best as possible. I'm going to give you some example of contemporary women and what they're doing in the kingdom. And I contend to you that the reason why these women are successful is because of what Ifad has done. In fact, one of the best parts of doing this project was to interview about 25 students at Ifad College, at Ifad College where I was for two years. And it's amazing to actually be in the presence of these young, articulate, smart women who have positive outlook on life and the changes that they want to introduce for the country. But Ifat worked very hard to share her own perspectives, which hovered around loyalty to crown and country at a time when Saudi nationalism was not clearly defined. In short, she worked to empower those who wished to be stronger, push for an institutionalization process to the hilt, and shape mentalities that were either reticent to move or too timid to act. I think that as such, she was a true modernizer who did not fit the classic theory of someone who copied from others, but one who adapted to circumstances as necessary, for she instinctively understood that society needed a sense of homogeneous culture in which people were inducted to be able to do business with each other. This approach did not mean that the search for such modernity was necessarily the search for secularism, or that it needed to dislodge the very idea that Islam and modernity were incompatible. In fact, her entire life proved that the search for material and spiritual progress were compatible as she legitimized women-only public spaces by using an Islamic discourse. On the contrary, she viewed segregation as necessary in the conservative public milieu but rejected restrictions on ikhtilat in private, ikhtilat mixing. The queen's objective was to add tamkeen and nuhud whenever possible so that Saudi women could benefit from what was offered them. Therefore, for Ifat, religion was a central feature of Saudi modernity along with technological innovations that improved quality of life. 
Cars and planes were innovations that were not found in the Holy Scriptures, but all Muslims, including pious Muslims, accepted both without any reservations. Scientific progress, ranging from medicine to space exploration, were also welcomed, since denying such progress was ignorance and truly un-Islamic. Now, in the second part of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st centuries, Islam embraced the computer, internet, and assorted digital telephones, which were not haram because they transmitted the word of God. To be sure, there was room for abuse, but the instruments themselves were not to blame for human behavior. This was, as its locus, the late queen's perspective, one that hovered around the notion that everyone should be open to innovation and rely on his conscience to do good and inflict no harm to oneself or to others. In other words, material progress was possible and worthy of encouragement, including for women, as long as it occurred within the limits and framework of Islam and its interpretations. She certainly was persuaded that modernization incorporated material and spiritual dimension and that both were largely compatible with each other. Of course, Queen Affat did not reject westernization and while she observed the existing distinctions between modernization and westernization, she nevertheless appreciated that Muslims, including Muslim women, could benefit from some of its features. Now, you know, I, I can go back. I discuss a little bit about ikhtilat as well and the problems that she had. She, of course, herself practiced ikhtilat in the best tradition possible. Dale referred to the, uh, to the dinners that she used uh, to hold in her, in her house, but more important than that, and this is something which I wrote about in the book as well, she actually attended male majlises, and she was present when the senior members of the family were participating in regular majlises that the king or the heir apparent were holding, and she actually participated in these conversations. Interestingly enough, not only was Faisal totally smitten by her, uh, and, and totally in love with the queen, but he was so differential that she always walked ahead of him when they were entering the majlis. Everybody noticed this, of course. This is something that really stood out in a very paternalistic, segregated society where you have that kind of a presence that makes a great deal of, of difference. Now, the preoccupations that she had uh, were noteworthy because obviously I felt wished for women in the kingdom not only to become, not only she wanted Saudi Arabia to become a modern country in the material sense, but to develop the wherewithal of a modernizing society by acquiring intellectual and normative values that enhance quality of life while obeying the faith. This is something which we dismiss all the time in our conversations and simplistic journalistic reportage that we read in our newspapers that in fact none of this is occurring. By its very nature, the kingdom is a fully mixed society, which included underdeveloped regions as well as ultra-modern environments. Both formed parts of the whole, and it was nearly impossible to impose similar values on everyone. What happened, what was acceptable in Jeddah was not acceptable in Qasim. What was acceptable in Dammam was not acceptable in Khamis Mushet, and vice versa. All of you know that Saudi Arabia is a huge country, almost a third the size of ours, and, and it has a very uh, heterogeneous population with all kinds of cultural, tribal backgrounds, so it's impossible to generalize about this. When the queen, what the queen concentrated on was to empower women to become cultured, informed, and especially educated in those scientific subjects that would allow for serious contribution. For her, a cultured woman was someone who knew herself well, could articulate thoughts, and interact with everyone with grace. Someone who learned how to think and talk with poise. Someone whose self-esteem was high and who could mingle with anyone, anywhere. Similarly, a well-educated woman was that person who gained knowledge and who could effectively use what she learned to improve herself as, as well as those around her. This did not mean that acquiring such erudition precluded a person from being religious, faithful, and confident in her sacred duties. 
On the contrary, she thought that a modernizing Saudi woman was able to better participate in her society while upholding local traditions and especially her faith. A developed contemporary mind was compatible with religion and its dogmas, even if it was perceived as being conservative. Consequently, her ideal modernizers were individuals like Dr. Sahar al-Dosari, the executive director and chief of pediatrics and neonatology at the Saad Specialist Hospital in Khubar, or Dr. May al Khunaizi, the executive director at the same facility. The list is truly long and includes such individuals as Nahid Tahir, the founder and chief executive officer of the investment bank Gulf One, certainly considered to be one of the kingdom's key financial institutions. A Dar al Hanan graduate, in other words, a graduate of the school that the queen created, the financial economics laureate earned a doctorate from an American university, no less, uh, and, uh, and became uh, the first woman to be hired by the National Commercial Bank, the, the, the kingdom's number one bank, where she worked with nearly 4,000 men. Her investment institutions, which specialize in infrastructure and industrial projects, turned a profit after its very first quarter as it pursued the motto of adding value to the kingdom. Or if you want to take Hayat Sindi, a Saudi researcher who was appointed by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization as a goodwill ambassador to support science education, especially, especially among young girls. According to Irina Bokova, the head of UNESCO, Hayat's nomination was in recognition of her work to create an ecosystem of entrepreneurship and social innovations for scientists, technologists, and engineers in the Middle East and beyond. The nomination was also attributed to her efforts to bring the youth closer to innovate, innovators and her dedication to the ideals and aims of the organization, testimony that Queen Affet's investments paid off handsomely. The number of professional women who made serious contributions to Saudi society was vast and growing exponentially. Many functioned within the narrow confines of the hijab, but functioned rather well. The overwhelming majority succeeded in their endeavors and discarded imposed burdens because their contributions were deemed essential. This, perhaps more than anything else, was the legacy of Queen Affet as she hoped that Saudi women would accomplish extraordinary acts in the most ordinary ways. Now, in conclusion, because of her unique relationship between her and her husband, it may be safe to conclude that Queen Ifat al Thunayyan and King Faisal bin Abdul Aziz shared a joint vision which focused on empowering both men and women to add value to the kingdom. Speculation regarding the monarch's reliance on his spouse to advance women's causes or on the queen to unduly influence her husband to introduce permanent changes in the traditional society were probably both incorrect and largely irrelevant. More importantly, the queen's mission after the monarch passed away did not end, even if her successors assumed their fair shares of responsibilities. For example, King Abdullah created the Noura University, which is an extraordinary institution in its own right. Ifat al Thunayan knew that his, that, her legacy, that his legacy, King Faisal's legacy, was intrinsically tied to hers and vice versa, and never did anything to jeopardize either. She knew that her late husband was not the type of person who indulged her for the sake of pleasing a spouse, though he was smitten by her, no question about that, but because he seriously wanted to see the Saudi woman innovate her participation in society. He knew, as she did, that the country needed every individual's skills, cognizant that those skills required acute development. To say, therefore, that the royal couple formed a harmonious duopoly that shared deep convictions about the future of the country would indeed be an accurate description. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, we have time for questions. Dr. Dr. Samin. Thank you, Dale. Joe, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Biography and context on a, a, a person not well known, I think, 
within the study of Saudi history and, and contemporary Saudi society. Now, uh, as you know, I'm sure, when you're driving from the airport road to central Riyadh or back, uh, you pass Princess Noura University, and it takes probably five or 10 minutes to get past this behemoth construction uh, uh, site, and it's, it is probably one of the biggest construction sites in, in Riyadh. So uh, certainly the royal family and the, country, the leaders of the country are paying more attention to um, drawing attention to this, to, to uh, the, the public identity and the empowerment of this sort of, you know, half of the population. And, and uh, let's say achieving recognition of this half of the population in, in public life, whether it's through education, whether it's through, you know, uh, naming institutions and promoting institutions after these leaders. But I am wondering at the same time, um, what, is, what is the broader context in which a queen or an influential princess can operate politically, can influence the levers of politics? Are they one woman shows? Or are there kind of, um, uh, just as there is a sort of interest group uh, surrounding the religious clergy or, or created by the religious clergy to promote their interests, and there are mercantile groups. Is there a, a, a context, a gender context, in which this is transpiring? At least if its own efforts, was she operating in the deep sea, or was she sort of banding together with other women in the family or outside to promote women's issues? Um, what kind of allies did she cultivate or enemies did she make? This is an excellent question because obviously the queen. Oh, the microphone. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. He wants back. me there. He wants me there. No problem. No problem. I wanted to get closer to you, but uh, but uh, but the microphone obligates me to stay here. This is an excellent question. I think that when you think about uh, the fact that she had such a hard time to introduce the reforms over the years, you cannot but conclude that she had many who opposed her. And there were lots and lots of members of the ruling family who were not happy with the pace with which she was moving. But it was not a one woman show. She built alliances. She had the wit about herself to actually make the kind of contacts that she needed to make and more often than not, she relied on institutionalizing the process. Let me give you an example. When she arrived, obviously healthcare was, was available, but it was rudimentary, nothing that one could speak of. Well, she did not necessarily just hire a few doctors and drop them uh, in the middle of town and, and let people go and have uh, uh, checkups and so on and so forth. Rather, she created clinics where women, local women, were trained. Uh, they were taught hygiene. They were taught childbearing uh, uh, necessities. They were actually gradually institutionalized in the sense of becoming habituated to operating within system. If you wanted to have uh, support, you had to go to these clinics. If you wanted to receive financial aid, medical assistance, if you needed child support, whatever, you went to these institutions. So she institutionalized the process as much as possible. She could not obviously do all of this by herself. She needed a, a, a group of people to be around her. Who did she hire? She hired all the elites of Jeddah, of Riyadh. She, she essentially recruited, she was a great recruiter, she recruited just about anybody who wanted to be useful. All the princesses and all the uh, wives of leading businessmen and so on in these cities were recruited by Ifat to do certain things, appointing a particular lady, for example, to be the head of, uh, of this charitable institution, another one to be the, on the board of this charitable institution. And she did this many, many, many times, not just once, not just twice, not just three times. Over the years, she did much of this. And although she directed the Ministry of Social Affairs to assume the financial burden, at the beginning, the Ministry of Social Affairs was not in a position 
to provide financially to any of these institutions. She used the privy purse of the king and the prince, crown prince in those days, to actually pay for this from her own pocket. An extremely generous woman. She used to really treat people without counting the dollars or the reals that she was spending. Her objective in this instance, I think, was to habituate people to get things done, to move along, not to accept for things to be handed down to you. That if you wanted certain benefits, that you had to participate in the system, that you had to invest your time and you had to learn certain things. And it paid off over the years. Today, in the book, I talk about this and I did, I did this on purpose, actually. You have one of three of the best uh, hospitals on the planet for, for eye surgery, the King Khaled Eye Hospital in, in, uh, outside of Riyadh. Now, this did not occur by mistake. I mean, when you, I visited this and I explained it in some detail in the book. When you have uh, patients who are totally disfigured by cancer or accidents, automobile accidents, where you have, excuse me, the entire face being rebuilt and artificial eyes being uh, built in sockets and so on. And there are not too many hospitals around the world that can do this, trust me, I've checked. You know, there is one in Germany, there is one in Tokyo, there is one in Cleveland. That's about it, a handful of them around the world. Now that it exists in the kingdom, now, of course, this is a referral hospital, which means that the privileged to have access, but anybody could have access to it if you work within the system as well. This, again, is part of her legacy. It doesn't mean that she did this. No, she didn't do it personally. But she created the environment that pushed others to jump on the bandwagon to actually serve in the same way. The same for education, the fact that I felt college eventually university existed, did not prevent others from doing, from doing what you described, the Noura University. Uh, the Noura University is named after Princess Noura, the founder's sister, who was also in her own right an extraordinary woman who did a great deal of, of important work. But again, I contend that Noura University exists today because of what IFAT started 75 years ago, 50 years ago to set the model for others to emulate as well. Let me put yeah. the desk question in a slightly different way. Okay. Uh, this brings out the anthropologist in me. Okay, come on, come on, speak to the microphone so that your voice can be heard. <laughs> what, what applies to the goose applies to the gander. Touche, <laughs> okay. Let me, uh, uh, here's the way an anthropologist would look at it, and this is, this is, this is earlier work. There's two sorts of queens, both of whom are at the margins of society. Queen with a capital Q is the one that we're talking about. And there's special roles. You can write about the Queen of England and how she dresses. Even there have been theses on this, how she goes to the toilet. It's not like other people and all that. Okay? And then there's the other sort of queen um, that is, you know, homosexual drag queen, who we could say is usually on the margins of society. This is older anthropological work. There's no margins anymore, of course. Uh, but, uh, but you have that sort as well. Isn't, doesn't she have a real, didn't Queen Afet have a real advantage by being the queen with a capital Q? In other words, she could initiate things and stand out. And this is not saying that she's one of a, well, she is, she's not one of a kind. There's a lot of queens around, but this certainly gives her more room to maneuver where nobody is going to say anything. Uh, I mean, that's all. In other, way, in other words, she can do all the things you say, mm -hmm. uh, but she can do all the things you say, perhaps, in Saudi society, uh, because she's a queen with a capital Q and standing outside of the society, not only in the ways you've described, fluent in Turkish, uh, presumably she must have learned French somewhere along the line. A little line. bit, yeah. Very a little, little bit, bit. Yeah. okay. And so forth. Okay, that's that's that's. No, I'm anyway. going to answer your question. The answer is yes and no, both of them together. Okay. Uh, it's true. What you're saying is actually correct. That she knew how to use her position to actually get things done. To say otherwise would be to deny the evident. But I think there was more to the story as well. Although she herself was a woman that knew the limits of power and she exercised them to the extent that the society allowed her, 
within the limits of that particular traditional environment in which she lived. I think more important, she was so sure of herself, such high esteem of what she could actually accomplish. This is a woman, this is a woman of character. And I don't want to compare her, in, in the book I make references to all the previous queens and, and French and, and, and uh, British and uh, even Joan of Arc. She's no Joan of Arc, obviously. She's, uh, she's, no the queen, she's not the Queen of England. She's none of those things. She is Afat. She's a woman that set out to change, and she did. But she did it in a style that was not in your face. She was happy to take incremental steps and to introduce, and to introduce the kind of changes that would not aggrandize her. The proof is that she was never in the public eye in the kingdom. And when the book comes out in Arabic, I think a lot of Saudis for the first time will be introduced to their queen because they don't know who this woman is. Even the students at Ifbat University, the university that she founded, don't know who the queen is. They're gonna discover an entire different person because she never imposed herself. She let her work impose itself. That's my contention. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, time for other questions. I've got another one, if I may. Yes, you, you might so. in a moment, but you got yeah, all the. Of course. In the great tradition of the Dickey Center course, anybody under the age of 30, and we won't check on student status, has the privilege of asking questions before anybody over the age of 30. I'm 31, by the way. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> so she was obviously a remarkable woman, but if you think, is there a current. Um, is there a current female figure in Saudi Arabia? I'm, I'm always thinking of the future and like, who should we be looking for or looking to to have this mark? Like, should you start framing Saudi Arabian leaders, at least in some part, based off of their wives' opinions and, or their queen's opinions? That's a brilliant question. Um, I think about this all the time. And, uh, and it's very difficult to answer your question because the individuals that are powerful behind the scenes are not in the public eye. The princesses that play the roles that we are thinking about are not in the public eye. There are a few. Uh, for example, uh, several of the granddaughters of uh, Ifat are very active in uh, the Saudi Cancer Society. Now, you know, to have a cancer society is no ordinary thing. Every country, there is a cancer society. But obviously, when you have a leading member of the ruling family, uh, a granddaughter of a king and a queen who come on television or go on, on newspapers interviews uh, and talk about breast cancer and the need for annual checkups to educate as many people as possible to contribute to the society so that it can continue its education role and so on. That's a remarkable transformation that these young women, uh, most of them in their early uh, 30s who are active in society are performing. Behind the scenes, the daughters and the wives of the heir apparents, the kings and so on, are playing much bigger role than, than people assume, generally speaking. And perhaps Saudi Arabia is still, in, in, in our studies, still virgin territory when it comes to this subject. But elsewhere in the Gulf, we see the changes taking place. In Saudi Arabia, we see it in the business world. But elsewhere in the Gulf, we see it in the ruling families. For example, in Qatar, where we have the former first lady, uh, uh, Sheikha Mauza, essentially take the entire Gulf by storm. Uh, in fact, in one of my previous books, uh, Legal and Political Reforms, I have a picture of Sheikha Mauza uh, meeting King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, and, and she is sitting one uh, leg crossed over the other. This is the kind of political statement that, that goes on, which is very important that women have a role to play in that society. And elsewhere in the Emirates, we see it as well. In Bahrain, we see the First Lady play an important role. Not so much in Saudi Arabia yet, but they're there. Those ladies are there. They're playing an important role. Uh, as I said, more in the business world, because you have 
I don't know whether you ever watch Saudi television, but you can have access to it on the internet these days. There is a network called Al Akhbariya, which is a, uh, it's like the Bloomberg version of, uh, of uh, the Saudi uh, business channel. And the women interview, interviewers on that channel are remarkable because they bring all these um, important businesswomen to participate in the discussions about investments, about purchasing companies. And most of them, they are wearing, obviously, abayas, but not black abayas. The colors are changing. Now you have red abayas, you have blue abayas on television. You don't see it in public yet. Black is still the dominant color in much of the public wear, if you would like. Although now you see dark brown and dark blue gradually coming in. So what, what you see these television programs, all these business ladies that come in, that, that really are imposing, smart, articulate. And then there is something else which I hint at in the book. In Saudi Arabia, you have now, uh, for the first time, uh, women lawyers, graduates of the law schools, that are in total clash with the religious establishment that has a monopoly on the judiciary. It's still forbidden for a Saudi female lawyer to go in front of a judge to plead the case. They are skirting this issue now by the woman lawyer essentially advising the candidate before the client goes in front of the judge. So therefore, there is a great deal of preparation work that is being done. I suspect that it will not be long before these women lawyers are appear in front of these judges. And there, you're going to have rock and roll in the classic sense of the term because the establishment is going to be very much opposed to this kind of intrusion in what they consider to be their fiefdoms. Things are changing. Um, even driving. Somebody asked me a couple of days ago at a previous stop, uh, did uh, Queen Affa drive? The answer, yes, she drove. Like most Saudi women who drive outside of the big cities. Uh, Saudi women are forbidden to drive essentially in the large cities. But if you're in the countryside, it happens. And the other day, they arrested this young, this young woman in Riyadh because she was rushing her husband who had a heart attack uh, while he was driving. She just put him aside, got behind the wheels, and drove him to the hospital. Uh, and uh, the police arrested her eventually, but that's silly. Eventually, it's going to happen as well. It's a matter of time. Yes, Christine. Christine. I, I don't have a, I have a comment on anything. I think we grossly underestimate um, women's visits and the power they have to spread ideas. And then the strength of these ideas that really men can't really fight against. Queen of Fat arrived at 15. She goes into this mother house. There's two other wives in there. She gave birth nine times. After each of her birth, there was visitings from all the elite women, because there's a three-week visiting period. Maybe there's a different length of time. You have all these women coming to visit and networking and, and talking for three weeks every time. And that gave her prestige or something, because she all these sons, all these things. And then she also um, was giving charity and helping people. She spread her message um, indirectly through all these networks. Mm -hmm. And when these ideas are spread like that, and then you want to, to put them in action, you have it. And men don't fight that much, mm -hmm. women, if it's very strongly believed. Mm -hmm. Because women are makers of reputations, and they can destroy reputations. They mm -hmm. are very powerful in mm -hmm. their words. And I think we underestimate. She must have worked slowly, because she was a teenager when she arrived. So she must have worked slowly at getting her ideas um, within the royal family, and also within the clients' tribal groups that came, the slaves that were there, the whole status she had access to. And these ideas then you know, slowly percolated until she wanted to put them in action. And I, I really don't think, um, I think very few men uh, fight when there are these very strong opinions. 
I don't know how many times I use the word in the book. Not too many times. I think either once or twice. I have to check. I did not use deliberately the word fighter, but she was one. I, might have I may have used it once or twice in the book. As I said, when I was writing this book, I had to be very careful. And, uh, and uh, uh, I wrote this book before I joined the King Faisal Center. Uh, so therefore, nobody could accuse me of doing uh, propaganda work. But I gave the manuscript to Prince Turki Faisal for him to read, and, and he was OK. There were one or two words that were out of place, and we changed them. But other than that, it was intact the way I wanted to approach it. My view is that though she was a fighter, though she never gave up, what distinguished this woman more than her sisters-in-laws and, and, and other family members, and she had to contend with a great deal of, of nastiness in the family when she came in. Here, here comes a 16-year-old young lady who does not speak Arabic, who is not, even though related to the family tangentially, uh, the Al the Al Thunayan are related to the Al Saud, but not immediate. Okay, in in fact, in the book, uh, I I discuss the Al Thunayan background for the first time. And when the book comes out in Arabic, that's another beautiful thing that I'm expecting. For the first time, the Saudis are going to learn about the Al Thunayan, which is quite interesting as well. But she comes in, and instead of ostracizing herself and staying behind the curtains and being the princess she could have easily been with a very comfortable life for herself and her children. On the contrary, she goes out on a, uh, on a permanent expedition. I was going to use the word crusade, but it's not a crusade. She went on in a permanent expedition to change, to change her society. And she did this in a remarkable way. As I've said, I've hinted many times, she did this by creating institutions where none existed before. And now that she passed away, now that, now that Saudi Arabia is a totally different country from the one that she discovered, her legacy lives, not just in terms of her family members and her grandchildren and so on and so forth, but all the institutions that exist in the country. And even if people no longer make the link between them, she was the link. We have time for a final question. Dan, I recognize well, he was under 30. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Um, and I wish I could take that to the bank. Um, a very short factual question. Uh, is, was she the uh, mother of uh, Turkey and Saud al-Faisal? Yes. Uh, she is. Any other um, not notable royals that we know? Well, the oldest uh, there is Abdul Rahman, who was uh, uh, in the army. Bandar, who was Air Force, uh, piloted F-15s. Uh, Saud al-Faisal, who is the foreign minister. Turkey, the youngest one. Saad, who is in charge of the King Fahad uh, Foundation. Uh, there is a half-brother, Khalid al-Faisal, who is now the governor of Mecca, but from a different, different uh, mother. And then there are four daughters. Princess Lulwa, who is in charge of the Affet University. Uh, Princess Haifa, the youngest one, who was married to Bandar bin Sultan, the ambassador in Washington for many, many years. Uh, there is uh, Princess uh, Latifa, uh, who is uh, married to a leading businessman in the country. And Princess Sara, the eldest daughter and currently a member of the Majlis al-Shura appointed by King Abdullah. Uh, one of two uh, members of the ruling family who serve in the Majlis al-Shura. Uh, and the other one, is her sister-in-law, who happens to be the daughter of King Khalid. Uh, they are the only two royals. Everybody else is a non-royal in the Majlis al-Shura. It's an extraordinary family. Notice two things. Uh, when you get our speaker going, you can't understand all that much about Saudi politics or politics elsewhere in the Arabian Peninsula unless you have a really serious understanding of, of kinship and relationships, uh, which is a way in my best Russian style of saying that we also have here, since Dr. Kasheshian is going to leave soon, we have somebody called Nadav Samin teaching here, who just published a book called Of Sand or Soil. I won't bother you with the subtitle, but uh, 
uh, it's the uh, it's probably the best way of understanding how genealogies work in this part of the world that we have. But it's underlying uh, uh, Dr. Kasheshian's work as well. He keeps coming back to that. And notice the other thing. I mean, this is I'm not going to make you an anthropologist overnight, but an honorary uh, anthropologist. Uh, it will happen where he's talking about the importance of the physical presentation of self of of What's the order in which Queen Apet walks into a majlis of men? Where does the husband stand? Uh, if you want to get a sense of that, the prior ruler of Qatar would do the same thing with his wife, Sheikha Mauza, who is now, of course, the leading mother. Mm -hmm. I guess the big mother, I wouldn't use that term in Doha, but uh, the, or maybe I would. Her title is the uh, Mother Sheikha. The Mother Sheikha, that's even better, mm -hmm. or the Sheikha Mother. Uh, do it either way. Okay, but, but once again, it's the relationships which everybody who has to manage these systems have to know. And it's the physical presentation of that. Notice how, how he said, in one other place, if somebody said, well, then she crossed her legs in front of uh, uh, President Obama. Uh, nobody would say very much about it, or she crossed her legs in front of Donald Trump. Uh, that's not a matter. Uh, but but on, the, on, on the other things, it's the presentation of self, which everybody is noticing, and which is very important. Okay, one last question. The ben has the follow-up. Uh, Dan has the follow-up, yeah, go ahead. It's a half a follow-up, so this is a okay. question. So, um, in the West, I think our, our con our concept of a queen is of someone who is uh, somehow innately cosmopolitan, but um, her life never, when she left Turkey and went to uh, the kingdom, did she have any, any relationships, any connections outside of the kingdom of any kind? Uh, yes, she did, but the, the extent to which she did, I don't know. When she lived in, in France uh, for extended periods of time, she was well known in the French circles, uh, and she came to the United States repeatedly, but primarily for health reasons, because obviously she had a heart situation, and uh, and uh, uh, consulted Dr. DeBakey De in uh, in Houston, and uh, and eventually she passed away on the operating table when she was having an open heart surgery. Unfortunately, it didn't go very well, uh, but she knew that it was she was very weak, and uh, and. Uh, but she had lots of contacts, but uh, I wouldn't be able to guess uh, the extent to which she had that. You know, I don't know. Okay, Dr. Kishesha, once again, many thanks Thank you. for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.